if somebody wanted to to build a or write a QB headstone for you, what's the most honest assessment of your career? Because your career is so unique. You know what? I think one of the greatest compliments I had was from an O-lineman in Chicago. I remember I stepped in the huddle and I said certain things that calmed the huddle. We went down, players made plays, score a touchdown, get the two-point conversion, win the game. That O-lineman came up to me after the game and said, man, I don't know what you did, but like you were able to calm the entire huddle in a chaotic situation and let us just play ball and not think about anything else. Like, thank you. So I don't know what you put on a headstone, but that was one of the greatest compliments. This is the moment that we've all been waiting for. I've been waiting for this moment. I was waiting until my dear friend Nick Foles retired to bother him as a member of the media and say, hey, come on my show so I can ask you a bunch of tough questions. We got him. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. He's here. Nick Foles joining me on Zoom. What's up, dude? What's up, Chris? Thanks for having me. Excited to see where this conversation goes. (laughs) It's going to go a lot of places, dude, but maybe not some of the places you think. I'm on my best behavior today, Nick. Um, because we'll my old, we'll yeah, we'll see my old Super Bowl MVP quarterbacks joining us. So I got to act like a grown up. Um, Nick, you're retired. We'll get into all this stuff, but you are also maybe most importantly now a hat guy and, uh, an apparel guy. And you have sent me some of your hats and I am not blowing smoke, dude. They are the most comfortable hats that I've ever worn. And that is the key to a great hat. Tell me about your your new venture. Yeah, so Pat O'Donnell and I were teammates in Chicago. Pat was a longtime punter there, um, you know, still wanting to play right now. But we, you know, he really had the idea for dad season in 2023 as I was leaving the league. And we just kept talking about it. And, you know, we had some shirts, some uh, hoodies. I'm wearing one of the hoodies right now. Um, nothing crazy, but then in January, I had taken enough time away where I was really just, you know, we were talking so much about the brand and what it can be, what dad season can be. And I'm just very passionate about it because I'm a dad myself. Um, I'm fortunate to have a wonderful father that pushed me and has always been there for me. Um, and it just resonated. So we're always talking about this brand. I'm like, but I really like hats. I think we got to have a hat line, but where do you start? Right. Well, it's just Pat and I and our wives were figuring it out. And we printed on all these random hats and they weren't what we wanted. And we were fortunate enough to find, you know, a hat guy and Scott, his name is Scott. He's awesome. And uh, we went, we flew to Denver. We designed our first generation of hats and we really had to learn. It was a lot more than we thought because I wanted like specific fits. I wanted specific comfort um, styles. So like we're getting samples. We're like measuring, like I get the samples. I'm like, this is too much depth. We need a little bit less depth in the XL. We made two sizes. A lot of them have flex fit, not all of them. But my, my, my thing was I want a really high quality hat that guys love to wear. They're proud to wear. Um, and that's where we'll start. The message is, you know, dad season, you know, fatherhood, being present with your children. But a lot of guys are working. They're not always around, but they, they still love their kids, right? So there's all different walks of dads. So we designed these hats. We're really proud of them. Um, we, we have four more. Yesterday I was on a call. We have four more new designs coming out that we're working on. It's been fun for me and Pat to, you know, talk through designs. What can we do next and just keep creating high quality hats? I mean, everything's custom. I mean, you got the custom logo, custom on the side, inside, you know, it says no days off. Cause once you become a dad, even if like you're out, I Isn't know I've been that told, like, true, oh, bro. Isn't yeah. that true? So, I thought we were going to have days off when I signed up for this. I mean, you can get, I mean, and there's a lot of moms out there. Obviously, moms are so important, the most important. Um, and, you know, they're always like, I've, I've even heard, you know, my husband has a lot of days off. The <laughs> point is, you know, even if I'm gone on like a work trip or like say I fly to Philadelphia, there, there's always going to be a moment where I'm going to get a phone call and have to jump on, you know, get to jump on a call with maybe my son. Maybe he's having a tough day. And, and the point is like the heart, like you become a dad, you're always a dad. Your kids go to college, like they might be there, but you're always there for them. Um, yeah. I experienced that, you know, calling my dad from home, even still having conversations with this brand. Uh, my dad has done restaurant business my whole life. And I'm like, dad, like, what would you do in this situation? I know what I would do, but you've done this a lot longer. So it's even been fun from a entrepreneurial standpoint, 
you know, talking to my dad about how to do this the right way, um, customer service, caring, and it's small. I mean, it's, and I like that though. We get to grow it our way um, and have a great heart behind it. And we're just excited about great products, great message. And, you know, hopefully someday we're doing like a, you know, stories like a podcast like yourself, where we get to jump on a, you know, co- jump in a conversation and talk about career, fatherhood, and tell those stories that impact dads out there that, you know, are in it. You know, I'm I'm in it right now with seven, four, and one, and uh, each day's its own adventure. But I'm super grateful for the time I get with them right now, and uh, most of my calls designing these hats and des- growing this brand. Uh, Pat and I have kids screaming in the background, so it's really yeah. organic and really fun. Um, but yeah, it's been a fun journey and I'm excited about the future of the company, man. You got a beautiful family. Uh, I'm really lucky too. eight, five and one. So both me and Nick are in the thick of it. Um, is there anything you've learned that you wish you could have told Nick Foles seven years ago when you were sitting in the hospital getting ready for child number one? I think the biggest thing I'm learning is you know, I felt like when you become a parent, like you're trying to instill everything in your kid and guide your kids and help your kids grow along the way. But by letting them, you know, fall and, you know, lifting them up at the appropriate time, they have to go through things. So like, that's my whole idea of as I'm preparing for parenthood through my faith, through reading, through just watching. And then seven years later, um, I was just at a dinner with my wife and another couple last night. And I'm like, they're, you know, they're asking about kids and what it's like being parents. And my biggest thing was, you know what? I'm learning more about myself being a parent of three children than I am probably teaching them. And I did not expect that. I thought, you know, I have this figured out, you know, I'm the adult, I'm going to guide them, but I grow every single day as a parent. And, you know, that can be like staying calm through a tantrum, which I am not perfect at, you know, Mm -hmm. I, We got, you know, Lily's really good. And we got the two boys that, you know, test me every day. Um, But I feel like my children are making me a better person each and every day. And I'm super grateful for that. And I didn't see that coming. Yeah, it's funny. I think one of the biggest uh, misnomers in the world is uh, you're something that's just you think when you're a kid, you're like all the adults have it figured out. They're fully formed. One day I'm going to reach this point where I just have it all figured out and nothing changes. And that's just not the case. I mean, I think you'll find that now where you embark on this new journey in retirement. It is truly dad season for you every day. And there's a lot that I've learned over the last, man, I keep saying five years, but it's going on six now of my life without football. And so I wonder for you, as you stare at this kind of expanse, I mean, it really is an expanse. It's like the next 60 years of your life, hopefully what you wonder it's going to be like, what are your fears? Do you have any, um, when it comes to leaving football, what are you excited about? Yeah. I mean, you just never know. I mean, football has become such a part of like who we are. Right. I mean, we've done it. I mean, I remember in first grade, they asked you what you want to be when you grow up. And, uh, it was, I want to be a professional athlete at that time. I didn't know football, but I knew that sports was such a huge part of my heart and like what I wanted to do. And then, you know, we've done it for such a long time. So it's like, all right, when I don't have that structure, when I'm not playing that game, um, what am I going to do? And, you know, my faith in Christ has been a huge part of my identity. It is my identity. And that's been a huge part of the transition. Um, But over the last year with, you know, going through the emotions and making sure that it was the right decision to retire, um, it started out tough. Like, you know, every week, you know, a couple of nights, I'd really struggle in the sense of mentally because you're used to, a schedule. You're used to discipline. You're used to going to work. You're used to going to practice. You're used to watching film. And then, you know, I'm home all the time and I'm with the kids and it's wonderful. And then I feel bad because all of a sudden I'm struggling, but I'm like, this is such a blessing that I get to be home with my kids and my wife. But at times it's hard because I'm yeah, used to Yeah. How could I else. be struggling? How could I be struggling? Yes. Isn't that selfish of me to struggle? Yes. And I had to deal with those emotions, but fortunately I have a, you know, amazing wife and Tori that we've gone through so much together through her health journey with um, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, POTS for short, um, my career, having children, moving different organizations. Um, So this was just a new test and I wasn't always probably easy to deal with because it's, you know, every week, you know, I'm doing good. Then all of a sudden, little bit of an emotional break. And then it happens again. 
but then I just kept going. I kept moving. I, I found structure in my life. I found I wasn't thinking so much about football and I wasn't missing lacing it up, but I was missing the guys. I was missing the structure. Um, it was just different not going to work and achieving something at work. Like, man, I had a really good practice. I feel good about what I put in the weight room today. Like it was different. But then I learned in this next chapter of life, like being around the kids all the time, you know, coaching, the, you know, I coach kindergarten girls flag football. And that was really fun for me to be in football in that situation and find the root of where it all begins um, with my daughter and a couple of my nieces and then all their friends, which coaching kindergarten girls fight football is no small feat. Like that's a big feat. Like you, you're trying to stop cartwheels. You're trying to <laughs> line them up. But at the end of it all, I, I had wonderful coaches with me and the girls were awesome. And we, we actually started having a lot of great success and it was a lot of fun seeing them have fun. Not shocked. I, you know, and I wanted them to, you know, I was like, Hey, you pull a flag cartwheel, you score a touchdown cartwheel. All that yeah. cartwheels, but we're going to find mm -hmm. it. We're not just going to cartwheel after every play. And I've talked mm -hmm. to other dads that coach like, man, the cartwheels. I'm like, it's <laughs> so much fun, but we can't, well, we can't line up to get a play on. But I found myself just being more present and being more just where, you know, like we always talked about in Philly, like, you yeah. know, be where our feet are. Yeah. I had to adjust to that in this new chapter, this new season, you know, dad, that's sort of dad mm -hmm. season, this new season of life. And now I'm sort of catching stride where, um, you know, it's summertime, summertime. I, I laugh too, because as a parent, I'm learning so much. I'm like, now I know why, like during the summer, my parents sent me to camps all the time. Yeah. And I'm starting to all, figure that one out. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, and we, my wife is wonderful. We had a conversation the other day cause she's like the last month of summer, I don't want the kids in any camps and I want them at home and I want us to spend all this time with them. Mm -hmm. And I looked at her and I was like, you know what? Like you are an amazing mother, but you, you just destroyed, you're going to destroy us this month. This is going to be hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was like, you're an awesome mom and we get to do this together. Um, but this is going to be a month. Like we're going to yeah. have to, you know, figure this out, but we are, and it's been great. And the kids have really enjoyed it. And, uh, like right now she's taking the kids to the beach and going to wear them out. And then we'll do another activity in the afternoon and we get this time. And I'm grateful for football for allowing me to have this time to be with my children at an age that, you know, they'll, this will, they'll cherish this forever. I'll cherish this forever. That's exactly right. There's no way we could be as present if we didn't, you know, get, blessed with what we got blessed with in the last chapter, you know, which was a career that provided for our families. And, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a gift and a curse because when you're doing it, it's really hard to be present, but if you can get the hang of the, the next chapter, you get all this time. I, I, I wonder for you how important working out is still, we were talking about that, um, yeah. a little bit off. I got my I free workout right here. <laughs> yeah. Which is what? Because you used to just drink bulletproof coffee and a little like you you were on the MCT oil and all the the the, the stuff that was above my pay grade. W what is it now? Hey, I'll tell you what. We were take. I was making that all the way up to the Super Bowl and after. I mean, I think we had like ten guys drinking that every morning. Even in Minneapolis, this story was probably never told. We ordered a bunch of bulletproof coffee stuff, uh, a bunch of butter, a bunch of oil, and I I you know, my thing of servitude was to make it for whoever wanted it in the morning before film. So like at 6am. Mm -hmm. So even in Minneapolis at the hotel, I think I ran coffee to like the six or seven coaches in the QB room had it. Cause I'm like, you know what? I can't just stop. Cause we're here. I have mm -hmm. to finish this strong. Yep. Cause at the end of the day, I also wanted the coaches to have enough energy to not like to make it through the day. Cause we all yep. know, like as much as we love our coaches, once they start getting tired, some weird plays grouchy. get in that playbook. They get, yeah, they get grouchy. grouchy. They and start all of a sudden you see a play zero blitz and, you know, yeah, yes. taking shots. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, there's times where, like, we'd go through a game plan and I'd be like, man, like, and I'd, I'd always ask the question. I always like to know why. Like, why do we have this play in? And then I was, I was like, did y'all put this play in, like, 11 o'clock last night? And they're like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, we can't have this play. Like, I, I know where <laughs> y'all's mind's at at, like, 11 or midnight. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, this play, mm -hmm. like, you got this from some random, like, who knows what it, it, no, we're not doing yeah. this, but yeah. you know, that's the fun of football. Um, that's the, you know, we all have the stories and, you know, coaches go out there and grind like crazy. Um, and you know, I, I don't know how they do it. Are you, are you, you said five, six days a week. And what do you think about Kelsey's recent mandate 
from his wife, Kylie, to work out three days a week. You know, I think it's, uh, I think she's being really nice to him. I think she <laughs> understands that, you know, three days a week, I mean, you know, I feel like he can do a little bit more than that, but I don't know the quality of workouts he's putting in. I, I imagine knowing Jason that they're going to be like quality. I, I, I would think so. So, I mean, he might yeah. be putting in like a two hour workout. That's like, that's good, man. Like get that day of recovery. That's good. And, but she knows that he needs that or else he's going to be super grouchy. And I know for me, I have to train or I get super grouchy. So right now, um, you know, I was doing six days a week, a lot of lifting, um, and I was having a lot of fun doing, gained a lot of strength that I lost in the NFL because, you know, we have this weigh in thing in the NFL and I'm, a, I'm a big quarterback, big boy. I entered the league at like 243 and that's out of college. And then you keep lifting, you become a man and you have children. Like you're not going to stay that weight. Like I was in really good shape then. So, but then there was coaches like, Hey, we want you under 245. I'm like, dude, that was like my senior year of college. Like, yeah. When we go back to um, high but school. But now that I'm done, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to lift a lot. I'm going to gain, I'm going to just lift and see what happens. And um, so I've done that. Now I'm transitioning more. You know, I did a poll on Instagram the other day, like, you know, hey, if I did a challenge of like a 10K half marathon, marathon, or like a ultra marathon, what should I do? And, you know, ultra was winning, which would have been like epic because that would have been past mm-hmm. the marathon, um, which I would love to do one day. I think that'd be a lot of fun to do like a hundred mile race or something, have a cool crew, do it. For Let me know, bro. Include your boy. And... Include your boy. I got a little pipe. I'll include well. you. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. That'd be good. You know, you could, you could go, I, I watch all these. I mean, for any ultra runner, whoever watches this, I watch y'all. Like, I love it. I love the grind. Um, I love the documentaries on YouTube. I, I'm a fan and it motivates me every day when I wake up, I'll watch a little something before I get going. But you know, I just started doing like a half marathon program again with some weightlifting. And then, I, you know, I know a lot of people, I think marathon won. So I got to figure out what marathon I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but right now I'm just trying to build that base. Um, but yeah, I think just throwing this out there, Chris, I mean, Jay, I'm sure there's people out there. I know a lot of people listen to your podcast, but I mean, if Jason wants to go out there and do the Philadelphia marathon, I know you mentioned you might walk. Let's it, do it. I'm doing it. No, I'll pre- run it. I think bro. That'd I run- be pretty epic. I run two miles a day now, Nick. I think I could get to 26 yeah. pretty easy or whatever. I think I is. think a half marathon would be great. I think yeah. a half marathon is a great distance. I did That's two a great last starting year. point. I, yeah, it's a great starting point. Um, I did two last year. I did not train for my first one. Um, I was just like in the shape I was in. And uh, I was very humbling. But I told myself I would not walk. And I got to a strong shuffle at the end, but I did not walk. I couldn't. Yeah, you were speeding. And walking. after it was like, I'm never – Oh man, at the end of it, I'm like, I'm never doing that again. I finished, yeah. I finished 205, no training, um, which is pretty solid for a big boy. 205, not bad. Like, not bad. Yeah. Um, and then I was like, I'm never doing that again. Two days later, I'm like, I can't wait to do that again. I found a training program for uh, eight weeks and ran the Orange County half and ran like a 148 something, which was like an 818 pace. So I was like, all right, this is cool. Like, Holy that's not bad. shit. Well, no, you still seem like you're in shape. So when I ask you this question, it's only because I don't get to ask a lot of guys this. I mean, like you, you just retired. You were a great quarterback. Um, there's no more secrets, right? Are you coming back? Are you are you going to make a comeback at some point? Do we have to worry about a Brady thing with you? No, there, there's no, there's no worry. The uh, okay. Monday Night Football game in Philadelphia will be the last two raw, and I just become. I, I mean, I am a fan now. I get to watch okay, the next good. generation, and I. So we're uh, so, we're good. The only thing you might see me doing is like intramural pickleball and like intramural golf and stuff like just that. Just don't but pop your Achilles, no man. Just don't pop your Achilles. Yeah. Here's what I'm wondering: what you know when it starts? Because as a position player, and you, you, when I was with you in 2015 in St. Louis, like that, that was an injury shortened season for me and the whole thing. But I was still in the prime of my career. And then, you know, like when we played together in Philly later, I was like older and you could probably see it. I mean, there you can tell when you watch a player that he's getting older, but the player only knows what that is defined by. Like for me, it was I couldn't turn the corner the same. My ankle flexion was going, you know, I'd come in from practice and my knee would be blown up. I never had knee problems earlier in my career or shoulder or You know, for me, it was I couldn't keep muscle on the same and I lost a little bit of explosion. What happens for a quarterback towards the end when you know it's towards the end and your body's breaking down a little bit? Is it torque? Is it your hip? Is it your shoulder? 
And like what goes away? You can't make certain throws. Like take me through the anatomy of a period of contemplating retirement, partially at least because of your your physical state. Yeah, I mean, and just to com- comment on you, I mean, obviously I was with you in 15, um, which is, you know, several years before we were together in Philadelphia and won, you know, what was it, your second Super Bowl? Yeah. Really, what, what in two years, right? Yeah, two years. Uh, and you, I mean, you're still a beast. I know you're saying you lost a step and stuff, but <laughs> not only that, right. just such an awesome guy. For, I mean, you were one of the key guys in that locker room, the leaders in that locker room that were so important and were such a huge DNA of that championship. And, you know, I got to, I'm so grateful I got to be with you in St. Louis. And what a got story, to be us, in us being together again. It, <laughs> it's just like, it's so special. Um, but for a quarterback, you know, everyone's different. You know, there's guys that, you know, wait till, you know, playing in the NFL is a, a great honor and privilege. And it's a childhood dream of everyone. And there's some guys that wait till, you know, the body no longer can do it. And then for me, you know, we we had had our third, um, we had moved, moved around several times um, the last four years of my career. I say of our career, because Tori and I were in it together. And every time you go, you just sort of, you get to a new locker room, new situation. It doesn't always like uplift you, but it's such a privilege. So you go to work every day, you build all these new relationships. And for me, it was just seeing the toll of like moving, starting over, moving, starting over and realizing like when we went to Indianapolis, I told Tori, you know what, no matter what happens, you know, you know, we were excited. Frank Reich's there. We were, we were super pumped to play for him. I was like, we signed a two year deal. I was like, you know, this will be the last stop. This will be so we just mentally can be like all in. This is the last stop. You know, Frank's the coach. He just signed an extension. Let's go get be the best teammate we can be. Let's do what we can for this team. And this is it. No matter what happens, if I go out there and ball out and there's a new like this is it. Because then at at this point, when we're done here, let's focus on raising our children. And then unfortunately, that year took a lot of crazy turns. Um. And it didn't go the way I think anyone thought it would. But I'm super grateful for, you know, being there that year to be in that locker room, see the type of locker room they have. Like, I'm not surprised the success that team's having because the locker room was so great. Like, you know, the GM's really good with Chris Ballard. Um, You know, unfortunately, you know, Frank, I love Frank. Great coach. It's just just things happen in this league that we don't understand sometimes. And, you know, Shane Steichen's awesome. So I know why they're having success. That locker room is solid, great guys. I know they've added some guys as well. Um, but for me, it was more just like heart, like the game had changed for me. Um, it wasn't like it was in Philadelphia, like that locker room in Philadelphia, you could play for so long because of the brotherhood and, everything about that city and that team. And even when I look back at my career, I'm so grateful for the other teams I played for besides Philadelphia. I'm so grateful because they gave me an opportunity to play. They gave me an opportunity to be a part of their organization, their city. But when I look back at my career, the only time I felt at home was Philadelphia. And maybe that's because they drafted me and then brought me back. Or maybe it was just like the locker room and then the city bond. I mean, that city is so unique in like the people that make up the fan base and are in the link on Thursday, Sunday, Monday, or whenever the game is. Um, but for me, I, I still right now, like throwing the football, I can throw it just as good. I'm probably stronger than I was when I was in the NFL because I don't have to worry about putting on muscle or weight, um, which is really exciting. Um, but I'm super honored and grateful for the time the NFL gave me the 11 years. Um, it's, you know, my rookie year, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to play this game past my rookie year. This is crazy. And to play 11 years, I'm so grateful, grateful for the, what the NFL gave me and then excited for what the future holds. Um, you know, being a husband, being a dad, being an entrepreneur, growing this brand, being in a community, talking to guys like yourself. I think it's just so cool. And I'm excited for the next generation. I mean, just seeing what's out there, the young quarterbacks, the young players. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun watching the NFL and seeing where it goes from here. Two things you said that really resonate with me. Number one. And, you know, like, I don't want to make it seem like I was broke down to where I couldn't play anymore. I left playing good ball, but I didn't want to start over. You know, in 2018, it was a weird year for for all of us, right? And coming off that 18 season, um, they had signed a guy that was going to, he meant that I would be on the sideline on third down at the very least and probably take less snaps on first and second. So Howie had kind of told me, listen, like, you know, if you want to be somewhere else next year, you can. 
And uh, there was some interest from teams out west. And I just, I looked down the barrel and I said, what am I doing? You know, like I've done everything I want to do. There's nothing left to do. Anything I do from here on out is going to be selfish. It's just going to be me trying to, you know, accomplish a personal goal. And at what cost? You know, picking up my family, moving again, starting over again. And the gamble you take every time you walk into a locker room. And for you, that's a highly um, variable gamble because quarterback, it's a fit thing. You know, if the coach doesn't like you, you know, there's only one quarterback that's going to play. Even for a defensive end, you walk into a certain building and, you know, you just might not land on the right side of the rotation. So there was that. And then also, as a guy who only spent two years in Philly, I wish I played a lot longer there. Um, and what you said resonated a great deal because of, you know, the place and the locker room and you having been there twice, I know it had to be bittersweet, like a lot more sweet than bitter, but you know, you had that record breaking season and then you get traded to St. Louis to hang out with me in the cold tub. Uh, and, and, you know, I wonder if there was any resentment and then how you were able to kind of push past that when they needed you again, was that harder than it looked on the surface? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think when I was traded away to St. Louis, like that was a weird situation. Um, I was coming off a fractured collarbone. I remember I, I had healed from it. I was in the best shape of my life and I got a call from Chip Kelly in the off season. I was really excited about going into my fourth year. I felt like my second year was a record breaking year. My third year, we were six and two when I got injured and I wasn't playing as clean a football because I didn't, now looking back, I mean, it's hard when you're not a guy that's like highly touted coming out of college, but you get drafted and then all of a sudden you break on the seat and like, you're like, everyone's looking at you to be perfect every game. And when you're not, it's like, it's strange. And I didn't realize the amount of pressure that was because I was just used to playing. And then when he called me and traded me in that one minute conversation, and then all of a sudden I'm talking to Jeff Fisher on the phone, like, can't wait to meet you. It was really strange. And then going there that year, it's like you said, like sometimes you fit with the coach, sometimes you don't. And it doesn't always work out. But that was a really tough year. But we got to be together. Um, a lot of great guys in that locker room that I, you know, got to play with again down the road, which was really cool to have like Rodney McLeod, Robert Quinn, like, you know, Rod, you and me got to win a Super Bowl together. Like, how cool is that? Like, you know, because we got to experience St. Louis and everyone, you know, that's tough. And all of a sudden we get to go to the highest peak together. It's really, really special. Um, but then that was a tough year to where I even contemplated, you know, it was well documented, like stepping away from the game after four years. I just, I've, I've always believed football is a game that is played from the heart. You have to have heart to give you that extra energy in the NFL to do something great for your teammates. Cause if you just go out there with your mind and just doing it for the wrong reasons, it's hard to, it's hard to do that. I can't do that. I have to play with heart. Yeah. And I lost heart because of what happened in St. Louis. But then I, you know, I went through a journey. God allowed me to go through a journey. And it was really my relationship with Christ um, that allowed me to get out of that dark hole. And then sort of, you know, Andy Reid reaching out, going to Kansas City for a year, being with him, Matt Nagy and that crew, Alex Smith and those guys in that locker room. I had so much fun. I, I learned how to work the right way. I learned how to have a great routine. I learned what a championship team looked like. And then after that year, I become a free agent and it's uh, Philadelphia. Well, there was another team. I think Tampa Bay was really interested. Dirk Cutter, who was there, he had, I had originally committed to him at Arizona State in high school. So I had an opportunity to go actually play for him. And they offered me a pretty sweet year, deal for two years. And then Howie came calling. I was like, hey, we'd love to have you back. It was a great deal. I was super honored. It was actually less than Tampa. And we just had to sit there and my wife and I talked because we were pregnant with Lily and or either that or we had just had Lily. And we really were like, all right, what is best for our family? Like, yeah, Philly traded me away and that's tough, but we love Philly. Or do we go to Tampa Bay and just start over? And we just sat there and we're like, you know what? Let's go back to Philly. That just always felt like home. We know a lot of guys in the locker room. You know, I'm going there to help a young Carson Wentz. I'm, I'm not going there to take over. Like, that's my role. We can focus on being a dad and going to work and being the best teammate I can be. So it was a quick conversation. And we're like, we were super pumped to go back because I knew 
what God had done in my heart is given me the genuine perspective and genuine heart to go there and be like, I am here to help this young starter, to help my teammates in the role that they've given me, as opposed to a younger me is like, once you become a starter, like, how do you not be a starter? Like, I didn't know that because I'm like, if I'm not a starter, I don't know what that looks like. Cause That's high failure. School, college, yeah. All those things. Yeah. And I had a heart change and then all of a sudden the year happens the way it did. And it sucks when people get injured, but I was ready based on because of my year in St. Louis, because of my year in Kansas city that equipped me and calloused me to prepare me for what was to come in Philadelphia. Cause without those years, I don't think I'm ready to handle what came in Philadelphia in 17. So I'm super grateful for those trials yeah. that prepared me for it. And I couldn't see it till down the road. I'm like, wow, okay, God, I see what you're doing, but man, it wasn't easy when I was in it, but thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I always think back to that trip to LA and, you know, we were rolling, we'd come off the Seattle loss and we were trying to secure a number one seed. It was a huge barometer for us going to the West coast and playing those teams. And we were playing so damn well and Carson dives for the pylon. I think Mark Barron clips his leg and, you know, when it was happening because he ran off the field and because he's a tough guy, I didn't know anything at the moment. I'm wondering if you could walk me through in real time, kind of your thought process as that all went down, were you just able to click into, all right, I got to finish this game. Or were you sitting there kind of thinking about big picture, what's going on with Carson? How hard was it to focus? Yeah. I mean, I saw him get hit and I saw him get up and I, you know, I've been around Carson's a tough dude, great quarterback, tough dude. I'm a huge fan of him. And, but at that time I knew just watching him and he stayed in for a play and threw a touchdown the next play with yeah, his knee dude. torn, which is epic. Well, yeah. Which is baller well. status, um, in my opinion. But I knew something was wrong. So you know what it's like when all of a sudden you start playing, your body starts changing, like adrenaline starts coming through it. The butterflies start coming. Your body starts like acclimating for what is to come. And that is a high pressure situation where you have to calm the nerves and go out there and execute and bring a calmness to the huddle. So I knew my body knew what was going on. So he came to the sideline. He had to go to the tent. He had to go get checked. Um, I knew right then and there, like what was coming. I knew something had happened just because of how tough he is and how he was walking and how he was grimacing. Something was different. Um, I knew going into that game, like, you know, I had to calm my mind and just go out there and execute. And we were able to execute. And I remember, you know, there was like a third down and eight or something. And we called all lightning. And earlier in the game, you know, Carson had a great game that game. He threw like four touchdowns and I think he threw an interception on the same play. They went two man, which lightning and the lightning versus two man. It's like an eight yard stop route. Your only answer is your slot receiver because outside you got the safeties over top. They're going to be underneath. Um, you can't throw outside. And then inside is not great at either because the guy doesn't have to worry about getting beat over the top. He can trail because the safety's over top, but if you have a really good slot receiver that knows how to play, you, you have a chance. So I have Nelson Aguilar, so I trust Nelson. I sidearm a ball to the side. He catches it. Game over. And it's because Nelson ran a great route. And he recognized two man, and I recognized two man, and we were on the same page. Um, but after that, going to the locker room, I mean, you remember, like, we win the game. Um, I think we clinched the playoff spot with that win. And it was – pretty demoral like it was a rough locker room out the game like guys weren't like super celebratory um and i understood man it wasn't like i i felt for carson like my first thing when he got hurt was man i said a prayer and i'm like god i hope he's okay um because like you don't ever want to see a teammate hurt and then after the game like yeah we won and everything but like carson's having such a great year such a big reason we had success i mean it took the whole team but he did such an awesome year in his year two of really developing that team and playing at such a high level and just creating this energy. Right. Um, but yeah, that was a wild turn of events. And then, you know, you get the news shortly after that his knees, you know, he's going to have this major surgery and then you're playing the rest of the year. And, um, that's in it. I mean, I'd say the first 24 hours with that news, uh, I was with Nate Sudfeld in the QB room and man, there was not much film watching. It was uh, just him and I talking through life, talking through the situation and feeling the pressure of what felt like an immense amount of weight. Um, but I'm so grateful for like that relationship with him and like Spencer Phillips and a few others where we just were able to talk through it as a, instead of watching film that day and just realize like, you know what, it's going to be OK. We're not doing this alone. All I have to do is prepare and do my part. We have a great team. We have great coaches. 
We just have to trust each other and take one step at a time. But it took 24 hours of being in a QB room, just like chilling, talking to get to that perspective. Because that perspective was not that way when we entered into that little, little, little storage room that we had. Yeah, it was a storage room. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was I, epic. It was cool, though. Yeah, it was. It, I thought it was when we came together. You know, it was really hard, but it was also a moment that that trip was kind of where we came together, especially considering the circumstance. And I, I remember hearing this out of your book, you know, not everybody was jazzed about you taking over, you know, you, you, you overheard some conversations maybe at a restaurant or something to that effect where people were doubting our chances of, of doing the thing we set out to do. And you know what? I, I, I understand that from their perspective. Like it's easy to think like, man, like, cause it really had never happened in that situation where I know there's been backup quarterbacks, you know, maybe before there's winning like a Super Bowl. Um, but in that situation where you need the quarterback, you know, need, defense is ball and special teams playing great, but like Carson's playing at a high level, like very high level, like MVP status. So to step in and take over, like I could see why the fans would think that, but Fortunately for us, like what mattered was the, as much as we love the fans, what matters the most is the facility and that locker room and what we think. And I think that's what's special is, you know, in the locker room, because I had been there previously, a lot of those guys knew what I was capable of doing. So they weren't worried. They just wanted me to get up to speed of what they knew I could do. And that takes time, like going in and playing at the end of the season when everyone's playing their best ball and your team's playing their best ball and you have not been playing other than scout team. And we all know scout team, you lose all your fundamentals. Now you develop a lot of ball, but like fundamental wise, you're not very good because like stuff's breaking down all the time. So I had to home back in, but, you know, we were able to acclimate in the final three games of the season and uh, make something happen. Was the like, you know, I'm a fan of Carson's too. And I've spent a lot of time on this show being like, you know, I didn't ever like the unnamed source thing. I didn't like a lot of that drama um, because he was doing the best he could. And I know it's the hardest position in sports and I know he wasn't healthy. Like even when he came back in 2018, you know, I don't think a lot of people realize this. The reason you had to bail us out again was his back was really fucked up. And, you know, like he, he fractured that, his back. Yeah, that affects your whole mechanics and the whole thing. It's not just how's your arm doing. It's like your whole body. And and he was stubborn. He didn't want to come out. He he wanted to play. And I think most fans would appreciate that. But when they don't know what's going on, they're like, hey, this guy isn't playing well. And then there was the whole, is it awkward between you guys? And, you know, like once they put the statue up of you, I know you've probably thought about this from his perspective, but like you're human. You know, like you want to be the one with the statue. You want to be, you felt like it was your story. And as bad as Carson wants the team to win, the human being can't help but be like, man, this could have been me. And I wonder how different reality was inside that quarterback room from the perception of reality. And I think a lot of assuming goes into that perception, but was it awkward between you guys? And was there any tension? You know what? I wouldn't say there was tension between us because we always got along in a respectful manner. Um, but yeah, like for him, I did look at like, man, like that's not easy for him, you know, to play the year he had to get injured and then see the team, you know, go and, you know, he's so happy, like Super Bowl ring, we win a Super yeah. Bowl. But that's not easy because he wants to be out there playing like he's a competitor. So there's definitely emotions that go into that. And I'll let him speak on that. But at the end of the day, between us, like, it, you know, it was always a respectful relationship, even to this day. Like I like people ask me about Carson, you know, they'll be like, how's Carson? I'm like, you know what? Tremendous player. Um, I cheer him on. Like I was just texting with him the other day. I sent him some dad season hats for the guys in Kansas City. That, that was my contact. And I'm like, hey, Carson, like, do you mind? Like, hey, take we'll get send you whatever hats you want. And like, you know, he sent me he didn't have to do this. Like he sent me a picture of, you know, the dad season hat his coffee and reading the Bible. Um, and he's like, Hey man, uh, just appreciate it. You know? And I'm like, dude, that's so cool. So then I sent him one back and then, you know, he sent me one, he wore our golf hat to the game. I'm like, he doesn't have to do that. Um, but it's like so cool that like he wants to support what we're doing. Cause he's a father as well. Um, and he knows like my heart and what we're trying, Pat and I, what we're trying to do with this brand. I'm like, that is so cool. And so like we put it on the dad season story and I just was like, this should show people like, there's no like 
issue with like what happened, but like that's not. I know that. I know that. You know know that. that. People in the locker room know that. Hopefully, but people just they they kind of extrapolate and 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 project what they would do, project how they would feel. You know. Yeah. And drama, drama sells, right? Drama sells. Yeah. You're, you know, you get to, you're doing We're speaking podcasts and drama sells, but you know what? Let's keep it simple. Um, you know, I love that Carson's in Kansas city back in yeah. up Pat. Yeah. I think that's a great fit. Um, I think they're very lucky to have, I mean, Pat Mahomes, best quarterback in the NFL. Yeah. Um, I know you could have like, there's other guys that are unbelievable. I mean, you can't argue with what he's doing there. No, um, that's not but, a if hot Carson, take. but if Carson needs to play, Carson will, help them succeed and do what they need to do one because he's a good player great player yeah. but another one because they have a great team yeah well isn't it interesting that he's taken the same path you took to get back where it's like and i don't know if he'll ever end up back in philly they got their thing pretty figured out right now but you know la then a year with with andy and i wonder for you and for maybe for carson like what can a year with andy do for your development and what makes that guy so special schematically, having been in those those rooms? You know what? Andy does a good job of retaining most of his coaches. So he's got great coaches. Um, they do a really great job. Um, yeah. The locker room and how he has created that environment, Andy is – biggest saying is let your personality show. So if you ever see any clips on Instagram, YouTube, whatever you watch – the guys are having fun at practice, but watch them have fun and dance, but then watch them lock back in, jog back to the huddle, get back in the huddle. Right. Like they have discipline, extreme discipline, but also extreme personality. And that's very difficult to have. I've only been on teams that are extreme personality, not a lot of discipline or a lot of discipline and you hate what you're doing. He has found that balance, but that's because every day Andy demands that and he instills that and he holds the star players accountable. Like I've been in meetings. I'm not going to name names, but like he has held like these star players accountable when they mess up and they know from being with them, like this is the right thing to do. And it's, but like a lot of coaches, like if they're a star player, like they let them get away with stuff. He does not allow that because he knows like these guys need to drive the team because they're also need to be the leaders. Not all star players are leaders, but he wants to develop them into leaders um, I thoroughly have always, I love Andy Reed. I love coach Reed. He drafted me. He brought the love of the game back in, you know, 2016 for me, just being a part of his team in Kansas city. Uh, you know, it's just, he's really one of the greatest coaches of all time. And I'm so happy the success he's having. Uh, it's just, you know, there'll be a documentary on him if there isn't one already, like it'll be thorough down the road. That'll be pretty epic. And uh, I know, like, the city of Philadelphia loves him. Yeah. And uh, it's just, you know, I'm honored that I got to play for him for, you know, two different years. That's, yeah, it's incredible. Another great reunion for you. Probably no better reunion than that one. A lot of reunions. And, yeah, dude, that's what it's all about. All right. Let's go to the Super Bowl. Guys, can you pull up a couple uh, clips for me? I wanted to, Nick, I was on the sideline for these throws. And I was just praying you would make them because we couldn't stop a, we couldn't stop anything. Uh, we needed you to score. I don't know if you remember me walking around. Do you remember this? The week of the Super Bowl, me walking around and asking every offensive guy, including you, how many points can you score this week? Do you remember that? <laughs> I brought, yeah, that didn't, yeah. How many points? How many? Let me ask you this. As, as we set these plays up, what did you think it was going to take to win that game? And was there a number in your mind? Like when you watch that defense where you're like, hey, we could score 30, we could score 41 points. Or was it like, you know, it's going to be a tough day at the office, but we have to do these specific things? You know what? I uh, I kept it pretty simple. Um, you know, you're a dad. I'm a dad. We try to teach our kids things. They don't like to listen, right? But they'll listen mm-hmm. to someone else. We did the same thing when we were kids. I mean, you know, your, your dad knew what he was probably talking about, you know, because mm-hmm. he did it at such a high level. But you mm-hmm. probably still didn't listen. Yeah. Um, I was the same way. And going into the Super Bowl, I took a lot of what my dad taught me as a kid and put it into play and kept it simple in the sense of this. My dad always told me, never look at the game clock, never look at the score, play as hard as you can until that clock hits zero and just see where you stand at the end. Because he didn't want me to change the way I played based on what was going on with the score or what was going on with the clock. 
because we all know that there's been teams that have huge leads that feel comfortable and stop playing and stop executing. Yeah. So the way that worked for me was the only thing I looked for was the shot clock. And that was it. And then every now and then you see the game clock, but I wasn't really consciously thinking about that. I was just thinking about execution of plays. Ex hey, Doug calls a play, execute this play. Doug calls a play, execute this play. Understand what the game situation be is. Like I remember going to Doug at one point, um, I think when we got the strip sack from uh, BG and being like, hey, what are we thinking here? Because there's like oh, a couple minutes left. We're up. Like, are we wanting me to like milk the clock in the huddle? Or are we wanting to be aggressive and score? Like, what are we wanting to do? Um, he's like, we're going. So that was the one time I remember like sort of like conferring with Doug, like what is the situation? Other than that, it was just execution, execution, execution. And then I just remember looking up when the clock hit zero, when that ball hit the ground. And that was the first time I felt like I like took a breath and just like let everything relax. And not like in a, I wasn't tense, but I was in this like flow state of just playing ball and just like mentally in such a good position to play the game where it was like peaceful but aggressive. And at that time, I just let everything relax and be like, it's done. We did it. We executed. We scored 41 points, and that was what we needed. That's um, exactly what we yeah, needed. Think, and your answer, I think, was 35. <laughs> Not, I think you were trying to just oh, be like, hey fuck, hey, fuck off, Chris. Like, I'm, I'm trying to get into a flow state and not look at anything, but I'll give you a number. I think most of you guys told me in the 30s, you know, uh, which oh, I I'm thought sure, would be enough. I'm sure. I thought it would be enough, but we really, we really, we really, it was down to the wire there. 30 All right, so pull, pull up this play. I want, I want Nick to see this play. Okay, talk me through. It is, what is it? 3-3. Uh, three, three. This is early in the game. All right? Yep. Roll the tape, Cowboy. You can see it, Nick. Um, right here oh, yeah. is a touchdown. I want you to talk yes. me through your thoughts on this play as it's happening. Yeah, this was just, uh, I mean, I forget what we call it. It's probably double post wide deep cross. Um, as we, you can see pre-snap man coverage, then uh, yeah. man goes with the motion, you know it's man. So typically the, the deep cross is actually the throw. Right. But I also am a player that plays with instinct and gut at times. And my gut wanted to throw Alshon a sort of lean it post, which is a, you know, he keeps it thin because yeah. it's man coverage. And then as Ed, you see at the top, he sort of leans away and creates separation and makes an amazing catch. But if you're like a coach and you're watching this and you're teaching this, you're probably telling your quarterback, you're going Nelson down mm -hmm. to the back right now. Like that's yep. your throw. And you potentially get the safety cuts Nelson. You have another cross coming the other way. That's mm -hmm. a man alert. But I would say the lean at post is not high on the list. Um, and so this was just gut instinct, trusting a player, feeling it, and then Alshon, ma Alshon making like spectacular one of the most amazing catches you can. I mean, like let, let's keep it real. Like it was a good throw, minded their job, <laughs> all this stuff. But like that catch is unbelievable. And the fact also like he's sponsored by Jordan Brand, and he's up in the <laughs> air with his Jordans making this. Like yeah. that brand is doing so well, and then, now they're doing even better. So. Um, that's just, <laughs> that's just playing good ball. That's just teammates. Um, that's just a lot of fun. So probably it was something that gave us thought, confidence, Nick, it worked out. Nick, that gave yeah. us confidence. It was like, Oh, we're going to do the same thing we've been doing. Okay. Put it to the next one. This is a uh, fourth and one, um, second quarter. I know this play, this is the Philly special. So pause it right here, cowboy. And this goes back to like, I've heard a story where, when you came in that year, Doug was like, what do you like running? And this is the culmination of that. It's like, hey, fourth and one in the Super Bowl, what do you guys want to run? Yeah. This is, uh, I think, in this situation, right before this, so there was a timeout. Um, we had, I don't know if you remember watching us all week in um, practice, but we had a speed option from the yes. shotgun. And every time we butchered it and it was awful. So that was actually the play that was called. And then we called a timeout and I ran over to the sidelines and asked for Philly Philly to this day. I have no clue why I asked for Philly Philly. <laughs> um, Cause it's Philly special. I, 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 I've all, I've thought NFL films like, and now with artificial intelligence, I know that you can create voiceovers and stuff. So 
there's part of me that thinks that could have happened, but in reality, <laughs> my brain was just probably in a weird state. And I said, mm-hmm. Philly, Philly. And now we have the Philly, Philly dad hat line and clothing line. So this is yeah, perfect. we do. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, when Doug and I talked about this, cause we were going to rep this against the Vikings in the NFC championship game, but we decided not to. And I just threw a touchdown to Alshon, made it easy, got to save the play. We were going to rep, we were going to run this second half to go up by two scores, mm-hmm. not first half to get up in general. Um, but I ran over there and I think that that situation where I'm asking for the play from Doug is a culmination of like, you know, when I was drafted, Doug flew to Austin, Texas to work me out at Westlake high school. That was the first time I really got to build trust with him. They draft me. He's my quarterback coach. Then I come back to Philly and I'm the backup quarterback. And then everything that happens, I go over there and Doug trusted me enough because he knew me enough to know like, Nick is feeling this. Let's execute this. Because he could have overrode this play call. But yeah. he pauses and he said, let's do it. And then we run this. And I remember going up there. You know, we had a shift. Um, we had to have, like, a some acting that took some time. Like, right here. And Lane Lane was the trigger for Kels to snap the ball to Corey. And uh, then, you know, Trey makes a amazing throw. I mean, people don't realize, like, Trey made an awesome throw that made it easy for me, but I was just worried about the DN right here, but the second he went down and I paused and I was out, I was just like, look this ball all the way in and just catch it and tuck it and score, and I didn't realize what this play would be um, for the city of Philadelphia or even the NFL. I just realized, like, man, this play worked to put us up on the Patriots going into halftime. Which is huge. And, and, yeah. and it is good acting, buddy. And and a great catch with the whole world watching. Brady didn't catch the ball when they threw it to him. That's neither here nor there. Um, it, Nick, when do you remember when we were getting ready for this Super Bowl, going to do walkthrough at the stadium, and we yeah. were running a bunch of fake plays? Do you remember yeah. this? And I came up to Doug, and I'm like, "What the fuck is this play, Doug?" And he's like, "Oh, we're not running this play." He's like, "He's like, we're worried the Patriots are up there in the." Uh, in the in the bleachers somewhere like are they yeah. hiding in the stadium we had like 13 you... guys on the field and stuff <laughs> yeah dude oh yeah so you remember dude, the... you guys ran a couple fake plays oh dude we we had 13 guys in the huddle and we were making we knew what formation we were making but then we're like just line up and do something random so we could run our plays but it would it didn't look clean because we had 13 i mean we were shredding papers after every meeting um we had i mean it was crazy the you know what we were trying to do and you know they just they like you know getting every advantage they can um but fortunately this play this play worked well and uh helped yeah, us out a lot and was, yeah that worked out well yeah. okay let's go to the third yeah, it was, quarter it was, it was a good play let's go to the third quarter i think we'll keep it 22 to 19 725 to go mm-hmm. i believe we got another touchdown here it's third and six and if this is the ball no, this to Corey, might be falcon stiffy yeah. yeah, Falcon Stiffy, baby. Falcon Stiffy. Okay, so walk yeah. me through Falcon yeah. Stiffy, including like Corey's not that open, yeah, so, and he's waving his hand like he's naked. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, he's a rookie, right? He's a rookie at this point, right? <laughs> so, you know, you really want a man coverage versus this. Um, and so I start my progression right to left, keep my eyes normal for the play because it's a typical play we run all the time. We want to get the safety out of the middle and really just get a one-on-one with Corey. Yeah. And so I drop back and I look. And then when I peek at Corey, I see like basically triple coverage. I'm like, oh, man. But if you watch closely, (laughs) the defender has a. So I'm like, I'm just totally in like my subconscious thought. There's like a slight little stumble for the defender that maybe slowed him down 0.1 miles per hour in my body. Like I'm not going to throw it. And all of a sudden my body triggered and threw the ball um, because I saw that and I just threw it. And then, you know, Corey makes a great catch. There's three guys around him. I think I had a fair, uh, fellow Arizona Wildcat on him, um, you know, Flowers. I'm sorry. Oh, buddy. yeah. Sorry. But uh, <laughs> Marquise. Well, I mean, yeah, but, I mean McCourty shows Just, up kind of late, you know, where you're like, oh, yeah. shit, and the ball's probably already gone. Yeah. So, like, look at my eyes, like, you know, going, starting right, keeping yep. it normal, look down the middle, find them, and then just, like – there's a split second where it's like this look. I mean, it doesn't look good. Even when it's caught, it does not. It is not clean at all. But was there was something inbounds? inside me that felt. Yeah, he was in bounds. They, okay. they looked at that thing a lot. Yeah, I agree. I, Nick, I tend to agree. Okay, hit the next one here. We got the fourth and one. And this was the 
the biggest play of the damn game. I, you know, and no surprise you go to Ertz, but talk me yeah, through is, uh, the thought process here. Yeah, this is Maestro. So left to right read, really built for man coverage. You have a zone read, but so we get this, and I remember dropping back, and your your first read's the back, and we hit a big play to Corey Clement earlier in the game, but they, you know, they end peels. Then the next is the shallow. So the guy, the cornerback drops off. So Ertz yeah. is like open for a split second. But if you look at it, I get pressure. So I got a sidestep left, yep. put it on him. He makes a great play. Fortunately, he's a yard past the line of scrimmage. I mean, that, this, like you said, this is like one of the biggest plays in the Super Bowl because you New England gets this play right here. Game ball game's over probably. 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 I mean, this we were all puckered up on the sideline, and you can see, yeah, the the end peeling with the back. And if you have more time, maybe you could hit him on like a wheel or something. But you know, Ertz yeah. is the guy. But Ertz so. does such a. I mean, he does such a great job. If you watch him, like sure-handed, but watch his route. Yeah. So Trey's running, or no, it's Selick. So Selick's running. Ertz does a great job of sort of lifting his defender and then cutting flat. Like look yep. here, lift him, boom, your and pick. Then, that's because of. Obviously, Selleck being a very savvy vet, great tight end, but then Ertz and him working together to make this happen naturally and yep. knowing it's man coverage. The only person that could mess up the play um, fell off it, but Ertz made a great play, and we got enough for the first down by a yard. And then we've got the the final nail in the coffin here, 32 – well, yeah, we're close here, but 32 to yeah. 33, this is the go-ahead touchdown, uh, third and yep. seven – on the 11 yard line. Yep. We're basically sending the back in motion. It's um, really, a, you really have, if you have numbers to the back, it's really like a bubble screen, but you're really trying to push the whole defense to the right and get Ertz your best, one of your best route runners, most sure handed guy on a lesser defender and having them run a slant. Yeah. And what happened is they, you know, I think we barely got this ball off with the shot clock. And uh, you know, I look and just Ertz makes a great play. He's so open. I, I, Threw him like a really clean softball. I did not fire this thing in there. Very, very catchable ball. I know that like at the end of it, he took like three or four steps and dove in. The ball popped out and everyone's like, is this a, is this a catch? I'm like, right. this isn't a catch. The NFL is in a weird position. He just took like three or four <laughs> yeah. steps. Like this is yeah. a touchdown. Like he's over the white. Mm -hmm. um, but this was, this was a lot of fun. So we win the game. This is not a – this. I'm not mining for drama here, but you know I love Tom. The handshake thing, was that much to do about nothing? Or have you guys ever gotten together and shook hands since? Like, you, you know, if you see him at, like, something else, are you going to walk up and extend your hand and be like, hey, you forgot something? You know what? Um, since then, I've actually been around someone that is very close to him and ironically FaceTimed him when I was with him. And – Tom just showed me the utmost respect and how much he respected me. He showed me some stuff from the Super Bowl he had and how, you know, he, he told me some personal things as well about that situation of like how he felt. So at the end of that conversation, I felt like, wow, you know, he just, he really does have respect for me as a player and stuff. Um, and, you know, yeah, we did not shake hands after that game or after when I was in Chicago and Tampa Bay, but for <laughs> him, Chicago, he's Tampa also Bay. a competitor. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just, you know, I threw it out there. It's but at the end thing. of the day, I did have a conversation with him. It's just a thing. But honestly, now I look at it as like a, a means of respect. Right. Like I got, uh, and he let me know, like he does respect that. And maybe we got under his skin. I got under his skin a little bit, but that was from respect. And, you know, Tom being, you know, one of the greatest, if not greatest quarterbacks of all time and leader, you know, the guys that have done it is, uh, you know, for him to respect that is huge because you want to have respect from your competitors, right? Um, win or lose. So since then we've had a, you know, FaceTime conversation, have the utmost respect for him. I know he's doing a lot of great things with TV and everything. So I, I knew, I know people will be excited to hear about the, the FaceTime. Cause I don't think people realize like, uh, it's not always what it, what it seems. And there's a thousand things going through somebody's head and uh, you know, like, uh, you guys are both awesome people. And I, I, two of my favorite quarterbacks both delivered me Super Bowls. What can I say? Um, that year, I thought RPO usage was a huge deal for us, and it kind of feels like if you if you went back and tried to run that same offense again, it might not work the same. Do Do you feel that way? Like you guys were a little ahead of the curve there? Yeah, I, I think we were ahead of the curve. Um, you know, we executed really well. Our o, I mean, O line, tremendous. Those guys are unbelievable. I mean, people don't give them enough credit. 
you can't have success without a great O-line. We had a great O-line, felt so comfortable. The way they communicated, made calls, executed up front, tremendous. That's a huge part of the o, uh, RPO game is points, blocking, execution, guys on the exterior, you know, receivers running the correct routes at times versus coverage, man coverage. We had a, you know, alert alert where we would change the routes to more rub routes and they had to be on it. They're fantastic. Our coaches did a great job teaching it. Um, we did a really good job. Now the NFL, these defenses are very, very good. And the one thing I've realized through my time in it, they adapt so fast. So if you get away with something one year, you will not get away with it next year. Um, unless it's the brotherly shove and then it's just impossible because they're just so good. Right. <laughs> Let's keep it real that you can't stop who was there. <laughs> no. Um, uh -uh. And you got Jalen Hurts back there that can squat like 500 pounds. Seven so, hundo. Yeah. I mean, dude's yeah. a beast. Uh, but yeah, I think we were ahead of it. We executed and then it became more difficult, but the, where we were also ahead of it was, um, coach Stoutland did such a good job of making our, so in the Super Bowl. I, I've watched things back and the commentary is like, man, these coaches are geniuses. Doug Peterson's a genius. Everyone thinks our RPO is just a slant router or a stick, but we're throwing go balls. And that's because our play action was past 67, past 66, which is an R. It looks like an RPO play action. You're hot if two come off like the put where the running back's coming from. But other than yeah. that backside, you can see you're hot. You're protected in the back because the back is going to funnel and help yeah. um, with number four. And so, but it's a, it's a drop back pass, but it looks like RPO. So we executed left and right in the Super Bowl, And that really started with like Chip Kelly. And it was called like past 246, past 247. We changed it, but we had all signals with Chip. So Stoutland sort of blended two worlds uh -huh. and it, it worked really well because everyone was so afraid of the RPO because we were really good at it. I was good at executing RPOs. Um, but then all of a sudden you had a drop back to it. The key to defense is make everything look very similar, but do a lot of different things out of it because you don't, you want them to be a step slower when defenses know what you're doing based on your personnel and based on alignment, they're very, very good. And they're very good at stopping place. But if you can keep them a, a half step behind you, you're going to be able to execute at a good level and hopefully score more points. Yeah, especially on the quick stuff. And we, I mean, it just was like uh, peeling bananas for us that you're right. You mentioned Stout. Who's a, who's a guy on that staff that you think didn't get enough credit for that run? I mean, I'd say the guys that, I mean, we, that was one of the most impressive coaching staffs I've been a part of. Um, just from the teaching and from what they brought to practice every day, what mm -hmm. they brought to the film room. But I think on most staffs, the guys that don't get enough credit are the quality control guys. The guys mm. that are doing the grunt work, the guys that are putting the playbooks together, um, you know, like the Spencer Phillips of the world, who now Spencer's in Oregon coaching high school ball and doing a great job of it. I always like to look at the quality control because those are the guys that are grinding, that are getting the coaches ready, getting them the material to breaking yeah. down the film. So then the coaches can do their jobs. And it really takes everyone. Um, so I'd say our quality control staff that year um, was the unsung heroes. Yeah, at the tail end of your career, I kind of wonder, it was hard for – it was hard for me past my prime to be like, oh, I'm not that guy anymore. I wish I was still, you know, like I'm, I'm winning. I'm having a great time, but I wish I was who I was a couple of years ago. And like for you, part of that is situational, being in the right spot with the right coaches and the right team. And that it's harder for quarterbacks. But do you ever look back like and say the last couple of years I was thinking about trying to get back there or were you just being where your feet were? As you said it earlier, like, was it ever almost like a gift and a curse to succeed at that level? And then the, the last couple of years, you're like, you've tasted it, you know? No, I think uh, that's a great question, Chris. Um, the honest answer is I remember playing the Saints in the playoffs and, you know, 19. And I remember, you know, we don't win the game. We become, we get real close. I don't play like a clean, the cleanest game in the world, but like we execute and had a chance at the end. And I remember just dropping back and playing in the Superdome and like playing with the guys and running that offense and getting the play calls and changing things and doing stuff. And I'm like, man, this is so much fun. I love this. I can play this forever. Like this is my offense. This is what I do. Like if I got to run this offense and play with these guys and wear this midnight green, like I could do this forever. Like this is so awesome. The reality of the situation is things change real quickly. You know, and I, you know, leave and you, you go somewhere else. And when I look back, you the blessing was I was able to have success in the NFL and do it with a great group of guys. Um, the hard part was, 
you know, I didn't get to always spend, you know, I didn't get to spend that time with just that one team, but also moving different teams taught me so much. And I got to meet so many different people. I got to meet so many great teammates. I got in Chicago sharing a locker with like, you know, right next to Jimmy Graham and Khalil Mack for two years. Like that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, Pat O'Donnell is one of my best friends. We started dad season because we both are passionate fathers and we want to instill yeah. things. That's from Chicago. Sam Ellinger in Indianapolis is 10 years younger than me and went to Westlake High School. We developed a brotherhood being together just because we're in Indy. Yeah. There's all at Jacksonville, like being around those guys and now they're having success. And now, you know, having them tell me, man, you told me what this was like. We didn't believe it. This is so cool. I'm like, yeah. yes. So I'm so grateful for that. Um, but definitely looking back, the hardest part was feeling that way in Philly and tasting success and knowing what I could do at a high level. And then yeah. going elsewhere and everything's different and personalities are different and you can't do, you can't play, like there's just things like that change, I should say. Yeah. And it's not what it used to be. Yeah. Um, and then even at the end of my career, when I kept like, even last year, when I'm thinking about playing, right, I'm making sure I'm done. There were moments where like, I'm like, man, I I missed it in the sense of like my time in Philly, like, and even in like 18, which was a tough year, like we almost made it back to the NFC championship game, but that wasn't an easy year for any of us. No. Um, but what I had to come to the conclusion was that team is no longer there. Those coaches yeah. are no longer there. This is different. It's great that we have those memories, but all they are are memories. So move on. Yeah. Um, so it was a mixture of all worlds. And I just chose, you know, through the course of this last year of doing emotions, just to look back and have gratitude. Yeah. Like, how cool is that? I got to play in the NFL for 11 years, got to be around great men and women um, and do, you know, go through some really tough times, some bad teams, which taught me a lot about myself, taught me more than winning. And then yeah. to have success and win, that's really special because then you realize it's so hard to do that. But the losing gave me perspective of like how to handle the winning. So all yeah. that I get to take into this next chapter of life. And I'm super grateful for that. Yeah, it's going to serve you well thinking like that. Here's a couple on the NFL right now. We'll get you out of here. The, the Mahomes thing, it feels like we're watching The Last Dance. I interviewed Josh Allen last week, and I was like, dude, I feel for you because it feels like you're living in the last dance and you're trying to rewrite that story and be, you're trying to beat Jordan. You know, you, you're trying to keep another last dance from being shot in real time, I, who, who is the number two in the NFL? We know who the number one is. There's a lot of debate year to year about, is it Joe? Is it Josh? Is it Lamar? You know, could it be Herbert in a couple of years? Like, how do you see that top five landscape shaking out? I mean, it's hard. I mean, all those guys, like, I, I think there's just some things you can't rank. Um, yeah. I think you can we try. Top, I think <laughs> what you just said is like tier one. Like tier one, there's tier one, tier two, tier three, and then tier three are guys that eventually jump up to tier one. I mean, um, but I'd say right there, those are all those guys have the potential and ability to lead their team to the Super Bowl. Therefore, they're the right guy to be playing for that team. Right. And that's and, how I look at it. How about Justin? Because this is a big year for him with Harbaugh and, you know, like somebody, everybody that watches Justin Herbert's like, wow, what could be, you know, and, and I, I don't, as you know, gosh, your career is is a prime example of this. And I always tell people this is like, it's so hard to just look at a player's body of work in one place and be like, that's who that player is. There's only a few players who can transcend any scheme, any context. And I look at your career and it's like a perfect example is like, you're the Super Bowl MVP. What do we make you look like in St. Louis? You know, like, it's not like you forgot how to play football. Herbert's had a lot of change around him and, you know, he hasn't been always in the best situations. He comes into this season, he's got plantar fasciitis um, for, for a guy who probably has had this at some point. When you come out of camp with an injury like that in your lower third, what do you think the effect of that is on your mechanics? And do you, do you have a positive outlook for somebody playing through that? Yeah, I mean, that's frustrating. I mean, coming out of training camp, I mean, you're always going to be like sore, a little banged up just because it's a lot of stuff. But when it's something that's significant that hurts your fundamentals, it's frustrating. Um, in Jacksonville, um, going into like week one, like it's the week before week one against Kansas City Chiefs, um, it was a really hot, humid day. We had just done some exercises in the weight room that really stressed my like, you know, 
core area. And then I did like a, a sprint out pass and like totally like strained like my entire side. And I had to go into, you know, the game, my first game, like with it strained and that was frustrating. And then, you know, I shattered my collarbone and Jackson, you know, this is when I'm playing for Jacksonville and that's just like tough. So like in his situation, you know, obviously he's probably, you know, taking care of it, boot. Um, they're trying to calm it down and, you know, the training staff, hopefully, you know, most of them are doing a great job. Um, but as it pertains to the success, you know, that he could have with healthy, I mean, we've seen what he's done since he's entered the league. Um, that is not a small feat. I mean, the guy has set records and is on a record pace and has succeeded in every situation he's been in, including high school and college. And I've personally been around him a little bit. And I'll tell you, the guy is a very impressive individual, very impressive athlete. And you can tell just from being around him, he's the type of guy in the locker room that guys resonate with and he can lead a team because he just seems like a genuine guy and doesn't try to be anything he's not. Yeah. And that matters, as you know, in a locker room, like coaches, players, like if you're genuine, even if you have a weird personality or just a different be personality, be weird. if you're like that, like guys like you, if you're someone mm -hmm. that tries to be something and you're not really that way, like it doesn't go over well. Um, yeah. But I really like I'm a huge fan. I want him to have great success. Obviously, Harbaugh is going to demand a lot from him and from his team. He always has. But I mean, his record speaks for itself as well. The guys had success all the way back to when, you know, he started coaching um, and coming off, you know, a national championship. That's pretty awesome. And I mean, it's not like he hasn't coached for a Super Bowl and done things like that. I mean, he's has he's had amazing success in the NFL. So I think with a quarterback like Justin Herbert and the team that they're developing, they got some good players. I think that they're going to do really well. With Justin Fields, you only saw him for a year. He's a much yep. different player than he was when you played with him. Yep. Um, I'm, you know, the talent he has is like tantalizing. So I'm always yes. like an upside guy. And I look at him and I'm like, somebody's got to be able to make him into a franchise QB. How, how steep is that climb watching him? And what did you learn about him just in being with him for a year? You know, I was with him his rookie year, and rookie years are always, you know, tough. That was the last year of that coaching staff. So all of us had to go through a lot. He had to go through a lot as a rookie. That's not easy. But to see him – I think when you look at Justin, athletically, like one of the best athletes in the NFL, um, you know, and then you see him as a quarterback, I feel like every year he's getting better and better and better, and he's just coming into his own. So I agree with you. If he gets in the right situation with the right staff that builds the offense around him, Every play call does not have to be perfect because he can make you right with his legs and with his decision making. So my hope for him and obviously Russell Wilson's there, who is a is a future Hall of Famer. So let's not take anything away away from Russell. Russell's a still got some in him. He's still, you know, going out there and doing his thing. But I think it's awesome that Justin Fields gets to be with Russell Wilson because he gets to see how Russell conducts himself, how he works and how he studies film. That's valuable as a young player. I got that, you know, when I was with Alex Smith, that was year five. And we got to, I got to feel that structure that worked for me. And that was year five. So Justin's in that same situation where this is going to benefit him greatly. And I think we'll see if it's not this year, because Russell may say Russell's a quarterback, like we will see big jumps from Justin Fields and what he does because he's with Russell Wilson and he's going to get to learn how to prepare is my hope for him. And I hope he succeeds. Can you speed up somebody's processing? Because I, I know that's the one thing when I watch them, I'm like, it could be a little quicker, you know, getting through the progressions, reading the full field. Um, obviously, he can make a lot of great throws, and he's a smart guy. But processing is a, is is not just IQ, you know, like processing is a feel thing. And I, I wonder how much in your experience you've seen guys get better at processing, or is that just kind of a thing that you are what you are? You know what? I don't think it's uh, you are what you are. I think a lot of that has to do with coaching staff and game planning and type of offense around you. Um, I think as a coach, it's important to recognize the type of players you have and where their strengths and weaknesses are and build a offense game plan around those because that will mm -hmm. give you the ultimate success. There's two frames of thought. Coaches that build around their players and put their players in a position to, su to succeed. And then there's coaches that have their offense and say this offense has worked you will make it work and that there's no choice. Um, I play for both. My favorite is Andy Reid is a, we're going to put you in a position to succeed and we're going to bend or build around our players and we're going to have fun doing it. So I prefer to do that. Doug Peterson was much like that as well. So I think with Justin Fields, the success, the key to success is 
how do you allow his mind to be calm when he plays? Like if you're a coach, it's like, you're going to make every mic point, you're going to make every protection call, and then you're going to read the coverage. Then you're going to audible and do that. I wouldn't like that. I didn't like that. I, when, when I was in Philadelphia, Kellis made all the calls for all his quarterbacks. And then I would give him time to adjust calls. And very seldom did I ever change what he did, maybe once or twice. And I, I like to bring that up to this day to Kels because there was a couple of times that I mm-hmm. overrode him. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you were right. But that's like 0.001% of the time. Yeah. That helped me out. And then I go to teams where it's like, hey, you got to make the mic point and then you got to change the mic point and then you got to do this and you got to do that. And it's like, you only have so much amount of time when you get to the line. I wasn't great at that. I needed to work together to do what I needed to do, O line, if I need to override you. So the key to success to any quarterback is knowing how they process and how they function to be before the ball snapped. And then what plays are you calling and how are you teaching them to read the coverages and plays to, to most importantly, execute the play to move the chains? Like there's some coaches that it's too much. You want your mind simple so you can play fast. The NFL is too fast to play slow. So I think with any quarterback, we're talking about Justin Fields, recognize who he is, recognize how to make him better. If you do that, you're going to see a lot of success because if you have a good defense, your offense will be dynamic and threatening. We all know as defense, like when you're playing defense and you know your offense is threatening and you can score points, y'all play better because you know that we're going to score points. When you play on a defense that your offense can't score points, absolutely sucks. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah. So um, that's sort of my tangent. I hope that they build around. Obviously, it's Russell Wilson. Uh, unless yeah. I, you know, I'm not in the news every day. I'm not like watching everything. Yeah, you ain't. Hey, bro, uh, you ain't at that point yet where you, you no. lose your mind and join the media. That yeah, hasn't happened yet. And I, and I, and I, in respect to Russell, the guy's a future Hall of Famer. And like, I'm just talking yeah. about a young player that at some point in his career, if it's two, three years from now, after Russ is, you know, decided whatever yeah. it is. Um, I hope that he succeeds and he's ready to go because I see Justin having success in the right situation. All right, man. This is this is the big one I wanted to ask you was I got a lot of little kids now that find out I played football, like my my son's friends or even my kids. Like they'll ask me about players and then occasionally they'll ask me about myself. They'll be like, hey, dad, were you really good or what? Were you better than this player? I'm like, man, we don't need to get into all this. But if if somebody wanted to to build a or write a QB headstone for you. You know, your career just ended. They want to succinctly put what kind of player you were or what you're going to be remembered for. What's the most honest assessment of your career? Because your career is so unique. You know what? I think one of the greatest compliments I had was from O lineman in Chicago. We were playing against the Seahawks. I got the word Friday morning before we played on Sunday. It was a snow game that I was playing. So I got Friday practice. That was my first practice with like the ones all year. And uh, so like not a lot of reps. You're going to play against a team that's trying to play for the playoffs on the road. And we have a two minute drive to win the game. And it's been a chaotic year. That whole staff is fired at the end of the year. I remember I stepped in the huddle and I said certain things that calmed the huddle. We went down, players made plays, score a touchdown, get the two-point conversion, win the game. That O-lineman came up to me after the game and said, man, I don't know what you did, but like you were able to calm the entire huddle in a chaotic situation and let us just play ball and not think about anything else. Like, thank you. So I don't know what you put on a headstone, but that was one of the greatest compliments because we all know that there's so much stress in football. There's so much stress in life, and we feel it. Um, even in that situation, going down a two minute drive, like, you know, you're calm, you're confident, you're playing, you're being present, but like, there's still a lot on the line. Um, so being able to instill that in another player, I would say I was a player that served his teammates to help make them better. Um, that was always the goal. And I got to be in different roles, whether it was starter, backup, or even I was demoted to three. Um, where for whatever reason, and that was tough, but it taught me a lot. And I still got to impact players by how I handle myself each day. And my goal was always to impact them and impact young players. And you know, it is like you, you go into a facility every day with the right mindset. And then within five minutes, something can shot, like shoot that mindset down, or someone can say something to you and you're in the dumps. Yeah. I felt that I've gone through that by no means was I perfect at it all, but I always strive to be the best teammate I could be no matter what my role was. So that's that's how I wanted to play the game. That's how I wanted to finish the game. Um, was I perfect every time? No, but 
I, I feel like I ran the race to the best of my ability and I'm just super grateful for the time. Yeah, man. I think you hit it on the head, man. You, you, you were an amazing teammate. I mean, you really were. And somebody that I still tell people, I'm like, he's just unaffected by success. You know, you have not changed at all. And if I were to give you a compliment, that would be it is like, I've seen so many guys have success and, Whenever you're asked about your success, you mention all you know, I asked you about the Alshon tour. You're like, hey, let me keep it a bean. That was an incredible catch. Um, you, you really did always lift the people up around you. And as an athlete, I'll say this. To get into that flow state that you were in on that run or in the year in, with Chip or what when you had your high moments, like I have so much admiration for somebody who's able to do that and that that takes tremendous mental toughness and confidence without being cocky you never were cocky and so i just um i enjoyed my time with you man whether you were in st louis and we were <laughs> nursing our wounds in the in the cold <laughs> tub thinking are we going to retire is this hey or not, we're on not, top not, of the world hey. hugging at the parade man it was you're the same guy and i think that's the people that 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 don't change and they remain true to who they are and you who you are is is not worth changing either but i was really appreciative of the time we had man i love you i i'm just so happy for you and proud of you no i I love you too man i appreciate it i mean you talk about that cold plunge in st louis but man how hot was that hot tub a hot tub was a hot tub was was 112 (laughs) they were trying to kill whatever was whatever we were (laughs) whatever was growing in her city they were trying to get out (laughs) No, because we had an Aaron Brockovich situation outside with the the burning trash under that hill that we. Oh, I know. Next to. Yeah, yeah so. there, you get you get the wrong wind there. That thing, that place, the landfill right next door. Well, now now that I've basically signed you off and told you how great you are, my last question is: Do you want us to all grow up and stop using your nickname? Oh man, you know what? Uh, I feel like. I have no comment for that. I, I can't tell a grown man what what not to do. I think uh, everyone find for some reason finds so much joy in the nickname, and I can't take away that joy. I mean, I'd say the person that makes – who do you think has the most joy in that nickname? Brent Selleck? Should we shout out Selleck Brent? Does. Selleck, Selleck does. Selleck does. Selleck loves to talk about that nickname in depth, oh, man. In length and depth. And, uh, oh, and, and I, I think uh, I think – bro, I just think you're the best, bro. Um I appreciate you, and I'm so thankful that you you came on and and had this long conversation because uh, you got to see it to believe it. You got to hear it to believe it. This guy is exactly what he seems, and I'm just so lucky to play with him. Um, Nick, congrats, man, and thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it, Chris. Thanks for having me.